Welcome this morning to Nashville Baptist Church and our time of worship. It is hard to believe that it has been over a month since our church family has had the opportunity to gather in this sanctuary and to worship as the body of Christ in communal worship and corporate worship. But we're grateful that we have the opportunity through these technologies to share these services and this worship experience with you. And we appreciate you taking your time to worship with us. And we pray that you will be blessed in all that is provided and shared. I would like to say a special thank you. And I have shared this in some of the devotional videos that, that I have made and placed on Facebook. But I have not specifically said a thank you to those that have been so involved over the last month. Sandra and Mike Manning, who work in our AV booth making sure that the video and the sound is done and done well so that we can share it. Our musicians, Colby Griffin on the piano today and Mr. Clyde Patterson on the organ and our deacon ministry team chairperson, Ms. Pam Bass. I'm grateful that they have given their time to be a part of this and we have others along the way that have taken part and will continue to take part. And this morning... Uh, we would like to share a special moment and a special time. I'm going to ask that Mr. Clyde walk around here for a moment to the front. Because it's a special day. He is celebrating his 49th birthday. And we are so thankful for Mr. Clyde Patterson and the gifts that he brings to us. He can make that organ sing and I would say and put him up against anybody as one of the best organists that, that we could ever have and, and probably in the world today. And we have a little special cake for you, Mr. Clyde, to wish you happy birthday. And if you'll notice, it says, Happy Birthday, Clyde. And on the side over there, it's got J.S. Bach, because I always call him Mr. Bach or J.S. Bach, the, one of the most renowned organists that ever lived. And we're going to take just a moment and share with him, and you can sing where you are as we sing happy birthday to him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Clyde. Happy birthday to you. And many more, many, many more. I want to see you on that organ bench for a long time. So we hope that you've had a wonderful birthday and continue to have a wonderful birthday. And you take that home and you and Miss Dorothy just go crazy on sugar for the next couple of days, I guess. But we are, we are grateful. And we're, we're grateful for all those, I said, that are involved in, in this time of worship. And we'll now continue in our time of worship. And thank you for being with us today.
Thank you, Colby, for sharing that beautiful, beautiful song. As you remind us on this second Sunday after Easter, second Sunday in Eastertide, as it is called in the church year, that we celebrate because Christ arose. I hope you will join with me now in the call to worship. It is provided in our service order that is uploaded to our website and also shared with our church members as you please respond where the words are in bold print. Christ is risen. Come and hear the good news of our Savior Jesus Christ. We thought he was dead, but he is risen and lives forevermore. Let us bow down and worship him. Let us join in praise and worship of God who reigns above. Good morning, and again, thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. Our Psalter reading this morning is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now let us pray. Father God, as we gather today for worship, we thank you for fellowship and family. We ask that you will strengthen us, restore us, and inspire us with your love. Fill us with your peace as we journey in these uncharted waters. Open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. And now let us pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
as we prepare now for a time in the service where we encourage that you please give back to the Lord of that with which he has given to you. We are grateful as you continue to contribute and support this congregation, this church most especially, as we seek to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. During this time, it has been a bit awkward for some, but thank you for bringing your offerings to the office, for mailing them, for giving online, and continuing to be faithful as the Lord calls us to be. So as we prepare our hearts for the offertory, please join me in a moment of prayer. Then please hear the, the offertory song and join in singing the doxology if you feel so led. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we prepare in our hearts to return to you a portion of that which you've given to us, we pray that you would continue to touch our hearts and our spirits. We know that there are those in this time that are troubled. We realize that there is uncertainty. We realize that there are times of financial hardship happening and coming. We pray that you would receive the gifts that we give, that you would bless them and pour out your spirit upon them, that they may be used to spread the good news, your love, your grace, and your mercy. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. John echoes down Emmaus road, dead or raised to life. The same doubt spoken first so long ago when a stranger came to two men on their journey. And it was not long before their broken hearts were burning. Somewhere between where you are and Emmaus, a stranger wants to come and walk with you. Somewhere along the way, your heart will be burning, drawn into the holy flame of truth. Right now he may be a stranger to you. What will he be when your journey's through? Somewhere between where you are and Emmaus, the Savior wants to walk with you. Some ask him in to stay as night falls on their own Emmaus road. Some push him away and never see the mystery. But those who take to heart the word that has been spoken As he breaks the bread of life, their eyes will open Somewhere between where you are and Emmaus A stranger wants to come and walk with you Somewhere along the way your heart will be burning Drawn into the holy flame of truth Right now he may be a stranger to you What will he be when your journey's through? Somewhere between where you are and Emmaus The Savior wants to walk with you A stranger wants to come and walk with you 
Somewhere along the way your heart will be burning Drawn into a holy flame of truth Right now he may be a stranger to you What will he be when your journey's through? Somewhere between where you are and Emmaus The Savior wants to walk with you Jesus wants to walk with you. Epistle reading this morning is from 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 17 through 23. I would like to share this with you and then ask you to please hear a call to prayer. And as we join our hearts together, please hear the pastoral prayer and following that I will share with you this morning's message. In 1 Peter we we hear these words shared with us, beginning in the first chapter, in the 17th verse. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God." Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Please hear now this call to prayer, and then we will join our hearts together in prayer. Walking with Christ is a journey of faith. We may not know where God is leading. We may not see a clear path in front of us. We likely won't have answers to the why questions. We sometimes won't like what unfolds along the way. Hardship, suffering, illness, and loss challenge us and require great trust. Seeing God's hand and recognizing God's voice is a challenge. Walking with Christ is a journey of faith. Therefore, we choose to trust even in the midst of doubt and fear. As we look for evidence of God's grace and mercy, we will find never-ending love as we walk with Christ this day and every day. Please join now your hearts with me in a moment of prayer. (laughs) 
Dear Lord, how grateful we are that no matter where we are on our journey with you, we can turn to you in prayer. Please hear our thankfulness that you are with us as we travel and we ask that the Holy Spirit will fall upon each of us as we seek to pray this day. Some of us are struggling with things that we do not understand that seem to have no meaning as we travel on the road of life. Others may struggle with issues of health and caregiving. Some struggle with relationships while others struggle with loneliness. Some face desperation as their finances have been turned upside down by the loss of a job while others complain about the job that they have. Some struggle with resentment while others speak before they think and act without a thought for how others may be affected. We struggle with the issues of war, of sickness, of things that are unfamiliar, of times that are strange, and we strive to make sense of all that is around us. Whatever it is we struggle with this day, this moment, prayer is such a wonderful and safe place to surrender and let go of each thing. Please give us the courage to, to let go of the outcome and what may be to release our burdens into your loving hands that we might walk the road of life with a lighter step as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who seeks to walk with us. Amen. This morning my sermon is entitled... The Stranger Wants to Walk With You, the song that was shared during the offertory, speaks of Emmaus, and the passage of scripture from Luke 24 this morning speaks of that Emmaus Road experience of two disciples who suddenly were in the presence of Christ and did not even realize it. I shared earlier in the week in a devotional video a little quote that that I saw gave me a little chuckle but it made me think of where we are and what we're facing it simply stated blessed are the flexible for they shall not get bent out of shape and in this moment and in this time I think that probably speaks to many of us, as flexibility may not be our, our main gift or ability to, to use as everything is turned upside down. Thankfully, we are capable and able to go to one that can make all of our difficulties go away. And give us peace and give us a calm. Sometimes it's hard to get that. Harry Truman, who was president post-World War II, or right there at the end when Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed, he enjoyed telling a story about a man who was hit on the head at work. And now, I don't know how much you may know about Harry Truman. Truly looking back, it is determined that he was an excellent president. He did not get a lot of credit during his tenure. But studies afterwards have shown that he he did well in that which he faced. And he was just a down-home person. Loved to tell those down-home stories. And he would share about this man said he was hit on the head at work. The blow was so severe that it knocked him out cold to the point that in his unconsciousness, his family thought he was dead. 
So they called the undertaker, the mortician, the funeral home, to come and get him, pick him up from the hospital where he'd been taken. And early the next morning, this dear man suddenly awakened. He sat up in the casket that they had already placed him in. He was confused. He blinked his eyes several times, and he looked around, and he was trying to put everything together. Now, can you imagine how shocked and surprised you would have been? And he thought to himself, if I'm alive, what in the world am I doing in this soft, satin-filled box? And if I'm dead, why do I have to go to the bathroom? We're probably all (laughs) facing situations, I hope not this severe, that are confusing to us right now. We're wondering, you know, how is this all happening? Why is this happening? It, it just doesn't seem to fit or to work. We are facing times that are unfamiliar. And there's something for we as Christians to think about, to consider... In all of this, to think about things as a church, because I honestly believe and I am convinced, no matter the number of people that have told me how much they're just loving it, sitting in their recliners on Sunday mornings in their pajamas, or as one person told me, they love being able to go to church and not have to worry about washing their hair, As much as we may be getting some kind of pleasure out of that, I do believe that following all of this, when it will come to an end, that there's going to be a surge of those wishing to be in the house of God. I honestly believe that. Right now, I believe that God is moving in all of this. And I want the church to hear these words, we need to be ready. Because there will be a harvest field that is before us. It is here now. We're we're not able to do quite as much, but we're able to do some things. But boy, when this is over, we're going to have opportunities. And as a church, my prayer is, not just here, but every Christian house of worship in this nation is going to find people coming in seeking Jesus Christ and what he can give. And when those people come in, there's something that we need to think about. We often call them visitors, but I believe that we should look at them as guests. That they're coming in, and our guest services need to be ready. I'm not saying we're some kind of restaurant or hotel and we're on a five-star rating or something such as that, but these are important people. Because it's hard for us sometimes to get outside of ourselves. You know, we, we want it to be about us more so than just about others. And as a church, we, we do need to be prepared. Because whether we like it or not in life, as one, one person in a church stated, the age-old understanding... That first impressions are most important. When I was in in college, there was a classmate of mine that most every day of the week, he wore a coat and tie to class. Now, this was was not back in a time. I, I remember talking to Mr. Clyde when he talked about being in school not too long ago. But they were required to wear coats and ties to class. Now, this was back in the 1990s at Carolina, and I know some of you are going, oh, okay. Believe me, there was no expectation of you wearing a coat and tie to class. But he wore that coat and tie to class because he said, as I'm walking across campus, I never know who I might meet, what impression I might make, and how that might help me in my future. Now, he might have been a little more ambitious than many of us to consider doing that every day, especially in those times for those hot, humid days in North Carolina But first impressions are important. And for a church, no, it's not about looks. That's not the impression I'm talking about. First impressions are important in the way that we 
we greet and impact those persons for the sake of Jesus Christ. And not just those that may seek to come into the church, but anyone that we may come into contact with on a daily basis. We need to be the presence of Jesus Christ. So I want to share with you from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter, verses 13 through 35, as we hear of the Emmaus Road experience. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said, it, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them. In the breaking of the bread. May the Lord bless this reading and hearing of his holy word this day. We have an image, a story, a telling of two disciples, one named Cleopas, walking down the road on that same day the first day of the week, which Christ had arisen. And they're talking about all that had happened because apparently it seemed that it was the news of the day. Kind of had gone through the grapevine and it was being shared. And as they're on their journey, suddenly a stranger appears to them. What do we think of when we hear the term stranger? Well, we know the root word of that is strange, so we know what strange means. If we call someone strange, we're not exactly giving them a compliment. Some people may take it as a compliment. But a stranger, of course, means someone that is unfamiliar, someone you don't know. 
someone that we in the South are going to look at and say, who's your mom and daddy? Where are you from? What do you do? But in this moment, this stranger, who starts as a stranger and becomes a guest and then eventually becomes a host, this stranger is Jesus Christ. And for the church, that is something important for us to think about as well, that the stranger, the guest, and the host, that we take those roles very seriously. And as Christians, that we consider and think about that as well as we walk our daily journey. Because there are countless strangers with whom we will come into contact. Right now, it's a bit limited. I try not to get out a great deal. I will go to the grocery store mainly if I need to. Come to my office here and spend a great deal of time or spend time at home. But still in those trips that I take to get some of the necessities that my family may need, I'm going to come into contact with individuals that will be classified as a stranger. I am not going to know them, even though my children and many of my family and my friends say that, son, uh, daddy, Kenny, wherever, wherever you go, you're going to know somebody. And eventually it does seem that I will run into someone that knows me or knows my daddy or knows something such as that. We still are going to find those people that are unfamiliar to us. And these two disciples, they, they suddenly have a stranger, almost mysteriously walking with them on their journey to Emmaus. And as they're traveling on this Easter afternoon and the stranger has appeared, they begin talking to him. And you see, in this time and in this place, in this part of the world, hospitality was of the utmost importance. Showing hospitality was a part of their nature, their culture, their instincts. We are called to show Christian hospitality because it was a major part of the early church as well. And there's even a Greek term, phylloxenia. It literally means love of the stranger. That someone you may not know, you show to them that welcoming care and love. It is the total opposite. Hear this, phylloxenia. It is the absolute opposite of xenophobia, fear of the stranger. Love of a stranger, fear of a stranger. And I know in today's world, I've shared before that I can be a bit too trusting. Yet I don't want us to get to the point that we, we're afraid of everybody that we may not know. There are those people who will seek to take advantage of you, and there are those people that could possibly harm you. Yet I hope that we do not allow that to become so deep-seated that we remove ourselves from what was so important at this time and then carried over into the early church. Hospitality. They welcomed the stranger to walk along with them and they were talking. The stranger suddenly became a guest because as they talked to him, at first, I just have this image you know, Christ comes in and they're talking about all that had happened and he says, What you, what, well, you know, in my vernacular, what y'all talking about? Christ wouldn't quite say it that way, but. What is that of which you are speaking? You know, if we want to put it into some formal English. What are y'all talking about? And I love the image that is there in the text as it states because I can picture it. It says, and they stood still. They were walking along. They went, boing, you know. Where have you been? You've been living under a rock? Where are you? Are you the only person around here that does not know what has happened? And they begin to tell about Jesus Christ and the crucifixion. And then that they understood he had arose. They said, now we, we can't be fully sure about that. 
We were told now that some women went that are part of our group and they went to the tomb to try and do what needed to be done and he was gone and they even saw angels who told him that he is no longer here. He has arose. And so Christ begins to connect to them as he is no longer the stranger and truly a guest, possibly even a friend as he starts breaking down the scripture, starting all the way back with Moses and sharing everything about himself, you know, kind of giving a biographical sketch, explaining to them what has happened and that this which has happened was necessary because of the the reason that God sent the Savior into the world. This had to happen. And so they, they listen, still not realizing. They get to their destination. And this is where Christ truly becomes a guest to them and no longer a stranger. They invite him because it's late at night. Stay with us. Don't, don't go on. Stay with us. And they still... They don't know who he is. And honestly, we can't be too hard on them. We, we would think that they would know the Savior standing there with them, but this is not the only place in the Scripture where it's happened, where Christ has not been fully recognized. His own disciples did not fully recognize him for who he was until much later in their relationship with him. Those disciples that were in the inner circle, the twelve. So we can't be too hard on them. Because honestly, would we, would we truly know? And today, even though we have a thought and we have in our minds that I would know Christ if he were to walk into the sanctuary and sit on that third pew, unless he's a real Baptist, he'd sit at the back. But still, I'd know who he is. Because we've been told all of our lives, if you've been involved, if you started out in Sunday school and you've gone on through, that he looks like this. If you could see the stained glass that's behind me, this image that has been etched and painted. This kind of stylized and classical image of Christ. If you'll notice the paintings throughout history that have taken place, he is kind of tall and lean. He stands above his disciples He even looks a little different in his features. But yet we are told the night that Judas brought the guards to come and take him away in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did Judas have to do? Judas had to point him out because he looked so much like his other disciples. He blended in. Now that's not sacrilege, just understand what I'm saying. This was Christ. We don't fully know. We don't have any bones that have truly been found. You could test the DNA and make sure because there ain't no bones left. He took them with him. The simple fact is that we have this idealized view. But in the absence of absolute evidence, I think this should open our eyes that we probably see Christ every day and don't realize it. You understand what I'm saying? That he is around us constantly. And yet we probably don't recognize him. Just as these disciples saw a stranger who did become a guest in an old Gaelic poem about hospitality, we're told I saw a stranger yestreen, I put food in the eating place, drink in the drinking place. Often, often, often goes the Christ in the stranger's guise. Meaning we don't know when we may be ourselves entertaining our Savior within that person that we are seeing. That person that that needs... Needs the love of Christ. That person to whom we may need to minister, to share. In essence, are we 
are we being Christ to those who need Christ and whom we should see Christ? The way one elevator operator in Nashville, Tennessee put it, he said, I'm just a nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Think about that. Are we trying to have those moments? Let me tell you, there are plenty of opportunities right now to be Christ in this world. And these disciples, as they, they did not know him or realize who he was, until that moment when Christ had gone from being a stranger to being a guest, and then he suddenly became the host as they sat down, it says, at the table. He picked up the bread, he broke it, and their eyes were opened. That in that true moment of hospitality, sharing a meal at the table, they saw Jesus Christ. And they said, were our hearts not burning as he spoke those words, as he shared about himself. Christ wants to, to walk with us. He wants to be with us. He wants us to reach out to others and also to realize that there are times that others may need to reach out to us. And I know sometimes it is much easier for many people to give help than to receive help. And I must honestly admit, I would much rather be the person that's giving that help. I don't, honestly, I love to stand before you and share God's word, but I don't really want to be the one that has to receive that help that is sometimes needed. So it's a, it's a hard balance. It's a hard realization. Yet there are those moments when, when we must see the Christ before us and recognize the, the times that we may need for Christ to come to us as well. There's a beautiful story that is shared about Viktor Frankl. He was in a concentration camp in World War II a Nazi concentration camp that I can only imagine what it was like to exist in that moment. He says he was at the end of his rope from deprivation. And at this point, when he had lost every possession and every valuable thing was destroyed, someone gave him a piece of bread. He wrote... I remember how a foreman secretly gave me a piece of bread which I knew he must have saved from his breakfast ration. It was far more than the small piece of bread which moved me to tears at the time. It was the human something this man also gave to me, the word and the look which accompanied the gift. The person writing about this says, keep on the lookout for that human something. The next time you break bread with another person, the next time you speak to another person, their look may be opening the eyes of their heart because they may be receiving a small taste of their first Emmaus Road journey. We never know where we will find a person when we come into contact with them. We never know that person that may not know Jesus Christ, may not have him as their Savior, or we, we never know that fellow brother or sister and the struggles they're facing. We never know that person that may be wondering where their next meal is going to come from or how they're going to save their home from being taken from them. We never know when we can provide hope by providing Jesus Christ, by sharing his love and who he is. 
by practicing Christian hospitality. We can become a part of a mighty spiritual movement. And I I believe right now we have an opportunity to share that as well. Of course, we have to share it six feet away. But we can still share Christ in doing whatever we have need to do. Hopefully we can see Jesus in strangers, guests. And that we can show them hospitality and that we ask ourselves two questions. Did we see Christ in them? And did they see Christ in us? I want to close with these words that often in Wales hang upon the door of a home and it simply reads, Hail guest, we, we ask not what thou art. If friend, we greet thee hand and heart. If stranger, such no longer be. If foe, our love shall conquer thee. Will we allow the love of Jesus Christ to conquer this world for his sake through us? That we will look upon no person as a, as a foe, but as someone in need of the love of Jesus Christ. Because the stranger wants to walk with us, and he wants us to walk with others in this world. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for for loving us and for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ. For filling us with the power of the Holy Spirit to encourage us. To live in a world that right now may may seem to be turned upside down. But praise God, we know that we have that which can make it aright, and that is Christ Jesus. Help us to bring hope to those who feel hopeless, love to those who feel unloved, and grace to those who feel undeserving. That Jesus Christ may be proclaimed as we serve in his holy name. Amen. As we share now in the hymn and song, the servant song, I pray that as we, we sing verses 1 and 3, that it will speak to your heart, that as we are called to to realize that we're travelers on a journey in this world. And right now the path is a bit confusing. We are called to to reach out and to bear the burdens of others as we know that Christ has borne ours. So please join in singing this song.
please receive this commission and blessing and then hear the beautiful postlude that will be provided for us. I bless you with joy. May you find moments of laughter and bliss in the midst of suffering and distress. May you cherish those times and may they sustain you. I bless you with the fruits of humility. May your humble and sacrificial actions be instrumental in preserving your community and loving your neighbors. I bless you with peace. In the face of financial hardship and uncertainty, may you know the faithful presence of the God who provides. Go in peace. Wash your hands. Love your neighbors. You are not alone, for God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Thank you.